Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, very happy to have Tavi Costa back with me. Uh, very popular guest last time we had him on. Um, a man of mining uh, gold and the great, the great reset understanding. I'd consider him a, a brother in arms in terms of where the world is. Uh, and it's been a lot has happened since we last spoke. Uh, so, uh, Tavi. So, first of all, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. And looking forward to this conversation. Delighted to have you back. And boy, didn't gold and silver suddenly move? You know, we you, we were talking the similar talk, but there was a lot to be proven. We had a three-year consolidation since the 2011, uh, 2021 highs. Uh, a lot of things have come. Tell us the big shoes that are dropping for you that you want to touch base on as you're going through, in your own words. Well, I think it's sort of uh, shocking, even to me, who've been so bullish to gold, and to see the what's been priced in in the curve for rate cuts going from seven cuts at six months ago to now you know less than two or precisely closer to one and uh at the same time gold prices you know who would have thought gold prices would have had the move that it had would have thought silver would be breaking out you know above 30 and now hanging at, at a 29 dollar an ounce. Um, those are levels that are really interesting from a technical perspective, but also historically speaking, because um, we've seen the sort of boxes checking in terms of the gold cycle by seeing gold breaking out from a what used to be a triple top. And now it's been record levels, you know, 23, 2400. Um, and then copper started to move. Now silver is in the process of moving as well. And then, you know, still we have the laggers, which is the miners, which to me is where the major, major opportunity really lies ahead. And so um, it is, um, you know, it's a lot of skeptics today in today's world. And, and that is not backed by history, meaning people saying that maybe this time is different. Maybe the metals are going to rise and magically miners are not going to make any money. That's not my view. But, you know, that's that's ba that, that's the the. The world we're living in and and you know narratives are always created out of nowhere and that's one of them and so you know we uh i always say this i mean people can borrow your conviction or i should say your thesis on on gold and your thesis in the miners and your thesis in silver and other metals but they will never be able to get the same level of conviction you do and Conviction is what makes money because when you have those shakeout moments, which we're having one today at, as we record this, a lot of people lose their focus and think about short-term risk. And when the big, big opportunity is always in, in, in buying assets that are historically undervalued. Like when people say, you got to be a great negotiator and, and when you, not really, let the market negotiate for you. Now, the fact that we can buy all these things so cheap is already being negotiated down for you you know it's historically depressed for a reason because everybody hates it and so take advantage of it yes you're absolutely right it's positioning uh, and knowing the times that you are in that actually makes you the money and being the only one that sees it when so many don't i find myself asking even on the majors tabby uh, i mean what's our biggest would we say newmont uh, of the mines what's the multiples that we're getting on the majors i've got newmont up uh, it's one of the biggest. There's Gold Core as well, uh, trading at about forty dollars. What are the what are the big guys getting as a current PE ratio uh, generally? Because they don't even seem to be getting too much credit for the gold price. Yeah, it's tough to look at PE ratios for some of those bigger mines. The the mid cap is maybe a better way to look at because their earnings are so depressed, and the fact that we're seeing the average grade for most of those mines. Uh, deteriorating drastically. So what is interesting as a technical sort of analysis, not technical from a price perspective, but more technical in terms of the of the market itself, uh, it is interesting that you have a premium being paid on on copper mines, especially the larger ones. If you look at Freeport, B, you know, BHP and others that have a large exposure to copper, you see a big premium being paid on those relative to the gold mines. And also you can see that the copper miners uh, relative to copper prices are moving in a different trajectory than the gold miners relative to gold prices as well. So, you know, when we think about the fundamentals and the economics of both mines, they're a little bit different. Um, you know, copper used to tend to have a, a bigger CapEx commitment. 
Um, and you know, they're, they're usually bigger projects and, and gold is slightly different um, and uh, they're smaller projects. But, but from, a, from a perspective of bottom line, the difference is not that drastic. And usually they're facing the same challenges when it comes to cost. But because yeah. of the green revolution and green agenda, capital is flowing into copper mines relative to gold mines. And the pressure that we're seeing in the big companies is so large that they're being forced, look at Barrick, look at Newmont, being forced to shift away from gold and into copper themselves, which is creating, in my view, one of the best opportunities in the, in the gold mine side, because not only we know the skepticism across investors, but now it's coming from the majors that are calling their assets non-core and selling them out, you know, with the, the idea uh, that copper will be more relevant than gold itself. And, you know, in a world where that we both agree that that is just such a, a enormous issue, globally speaking, uh, and, and seeing what's been happening with Japan, you know, or, or Europe, you know, being forced to cut interest rates recently here, even though they're revising their inflation numbers higher. You now, why do we think this is happening? Well, this is happening because, you know, they're trapped. I mean, there's no way around this. And so if we think that that's not going to translate in hard assets going a lot higher, then, you know, how else would you create a, a thesis, a long-term thesis on this? Because it's as clear to me as it sounds. And, and so we have to kind of uh, understand the vision uh, and, and forget about volatility in the short term and try to take advantage of these deals that are just so cheap. And so, I mean, that's where I've been spending more. I, I, I'm a macro junk guy. I, I spend most of my time looking at macro too. And um, you know, still uh, very involved with most of the macro decisions that happen at Kraska. But when I think about uh, the real opportunity is 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 that you know the big short opportunity today is devaluation of fiat currencies and you know when you can find a business that is literally linked to the uh, you know uh, fundamentals linked to the upward um, upward movement of hard asset prices you know sign me up I think that's where the 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 game really is for the next five to ten years. 100%. I mean, I couldn't have captured that better myself. And it's amazing. I find that the analogy I would give you is copper having this boom. And of course, we had Soros then saying recently, it was about a month ago, the most obvious trade now is copper, you know, and all of this uh, and driving it in. And it's kind of like, an, a, 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 I call it like a neighborhood. And your neighbor's house has become super cool and getting a whole bunch of bidders. And instead of your house value going up, everybody's going, no one wants to bid on your house. We must have the house next door, you know. And I, I think copper is like the 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 the, the sort of the, the cousin, the, the you know the poor cousin of gold uh, and silver, but definitely in relation. Uh, and in fact, the whole category should go up. But it seems we all have to go blind and all chase the thing, the thing, the thing, uh, whilst forgetting that the next thing is right standing next to you, and nobody's paying any attention to it. And it's bizarre, isn't it? Well, and it you know. Wouldn't you die for a thesis where central banks are accumulating gold, you know, two, three years ago? I would. And now we have that, right? I mean, every central bank in the world has been pretty much accumulating gold recently. We've seen that in the data. That's all disclosed data. Who knows what's happening undisclosedly? Because if you do the math of how much gold has gone up in prices and it's not driven by Western vehicles like ETFs and other things, and even future markets, which are not positioned uh, you know, on extreme long side by most non-commercial players uh, and commercial players is to me a, a, a sign of, of how much undisclosed has been happening. Um, and, you know, this is this is the real thesis. And what people forget, I, I love your analogy of the neighborhood. What people forget a lot of times is that gold and copper mines are usually, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a mine that is producing copper a lot of times actually have gold as well and the other way around. And the same thing goes to other byproducts of, of other copper mines like silver that you mentioned even before this interview get recorded. Um, and, you know, the, the, the economics of these uh, businesses is improving drastically. And yes, the cost is also going to increase. That's a normal function of this. But understanding that in history, um, there are times you want to own mining businesses. And I cannot think of a better time than today. In the 70s, yes, costs increased too. 
you know, interest rates are going up a lot more. You know, imagine in a world that today interest rates just functionally cannot go a lot higher. Why? Because everything breaks. And so, yes. you know, you think the Fed is not going to take the card of unemployment rates and, and labor markets deteriorating anytime they need it to? Yes, they will. Of course they will, because they have to. They don't have an option. If they cut rates three times, it reduces the, the interest payment by almost one third. Now, at what point do we see this shifting back to financial repression? We're probably not too far from it. Now, is it going to happen tomorrow? I have no idea and probably not, but it will probably happen in, in, in the next years or so. And, and we as investors need to have that sort of wearing that hat uh, rather than, you know, so worry about short term and uh, short term moves in markets, because that's really irrelevant at the end of the day. 100%. Get up to the top of the mountain instead of being in them amongst the forest and the trees and see the major path, the key trend and stick with it because your day will come. You don't have to be accurate to the week with your predictions or the even the month. Your day will come as sure as uh, as sure as the sun comes up in the morning eventually. Um, and I think that's very much from our preliminary discussion exactly what you're doing. And what's the what's the upside when the awakening? I mean, how big is big uh, if for people that that are in? Uh, let's never mind listed entities. You also mentioned there's a lot of, a lot going on in the unlisted space, and that most of that market is not appreciating and is still using eighteen hundred and fifty dollars as a as you know play safe accounting, a sort of an accountant's rule of conservatism type thing. We are we've traded two thousand four hundred. We're we're base building now while we've had a spell of dollar strength, but surely. Uh, surely that's way too conservative and these models are underpricing these assets. Well, the, the mining industry is so broken currently that when they're selling an asset, they have to make it attractive by basically setting gold or metal prices that are just completely unrealistic if you do any macro analysis, meaning unrealistic on the low side. Um, and, you know, it's basically assuming gold prices would be at 1800, not joking you know, by 2035. And, you know, when, <laughs> if you ask me, I, I think, I think we can see triple number, uh, a triple uh, of, of that price in, in, in that kind of time frame, if not more, right? I mean, I, I think I'm being conservative, to be quite honest, yeah. especially yeah. If, if central banks uh, will have to be buying as much gold as we think they will, because they own 20% of the balance sheet today. And back in the 70s, they used to own close to 74 and so can we go to the world like that? Yeah, let's see, we just double from where it is right now and go to 40%, which is even below the historical um, the historical average that they usually own. And so in a world where discipline has to be reestablished at some point, which that really means enhancing the quality of international reserves by buying gold and transitioning away from treasuries and other sovereign institutions and sovereign debt in general, you know that that world is is a world where gold prices are not going to be 1800s they're going to be a crazy numbers and so i tend to say because i don't know nobody knows what the target price is 10 years from now but i think we're going to see stupid prices i think we're going to yeah. i mean who would have thought that bitcoin would be trading at 60,000 and it might be a lot higher who knows 10 years from now and so you know sixty thousand dollars for 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 bitcoin so what is gold worth <laughs> so you know yeah. i I think it's a lot more than what it is right now. And you and you start thinking about that way. What is silver worth? What is copper worth? I mean, yes, copper, everyone is talking about it. And I love copper too, but you know, I always get my you know, some level of skepticism when even my neighbor is is telling me the, about copper shortages. Um, you know, but uh what is silver worth? You know, what is zinc worth? Uh, why do we have such a, 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 a discount to buy a zinc mine? I mean, who in the right minds think we're going to see a reshoring, you know, green revolution, all these other trends that we're seeing, you know, uh, you know particularly the revamping of electrical grids and, and data centers being built in order to create artificial intelligence to become actually more deflationary at some point. We need to build things first. And how do we, you know, how do we do all that without making the metals and mining industry at least more relevant than a margin error, which is it is what it is right now. It's it's 
you know, less than zero, you know, less than one percent of the global equity market. And a reminder for viewers, you know, just the precious metal space alone, looking at gold, silver, you know, platinum, and so forth, and then the miners in that space used to be close to 30% of the global assets market. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go back to the, that world of 30%. Maybe we will. That's the upside. But, you know, let's just say we just double from here, you know, to your answer, to your question about... What is it today? Tell everybody what it is today. Oh, it's less than 1% right now. You That's know? the key. And... That's the key. And what is NVIDIA's market cap? <laughs> You you know it it's 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 three trillion dollars now and it's yeah. you know <laughs> so yeah. and, and you know and what's the it's... irony Francis you know what's the irony is that the higher Nvidia goes the more GPUs is is because it's you know we would hope that that means that fundamentals are improving alongside which means you know they might not be increasing to the same magnitude that prices are increasing which is fine that's that's why we see inflated uh, multiples. But the higher NVIDIA goes, it means the higher the demand for GPUs is, and we would think. Yeah. What does that mean about metals? What does so that mean that, about yeah. <laughs> energy product, uh, energy, yeah, or energy electricity consumption? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that's why I say it does just look like a disproportion. The other thing you said that was super interesting, ref mining industries, they're not applying the inflation and the upside on the gold price. But they are applying all the worst kinds of cost increases for the, the, the valuation of the mine in terms of future labor costs, uh, you know, energy trajectories as well. So on what, it's, almost dis, it's almost asymmetric in that there's no upside for you on the product side, on the revenue side. And here's all these extra costs that are going to get much more expensive on, on the cost side. So, you yeah. know, it's a good business, you know, almost telling you. Or, or the other thing would be the discount rate itself, because the discount sure. rate, if you think about it, it's it's you got cash flows in the following yeah. years, and then you're discounting that cash flow. Just let's just assume the discount rate is basically risk. You know, how much risk are you paying uh, to uh, to get that those cash flows in the future, uh, and then you discount that for the present value. Well, if you think it that way, part of that discount rate, let's just assume it's we're using 10%. Uh, which is in majority of those mine deals that are being sold today, especially privately, are being sold with kind of a eight to ten percent discount rate. Well, if they're assuming inflation in the future, which is fine, they should, but they're not assuming inflation in the metal prices, which is not fine. I totally disagree with that. But that's you know that that's causing the price to be lower, better for me as a buyer. And then when they discount this thing, you know, the higher the discount rate the lower the present value, so the lower yeah. the price I pay. Why in the world are they adding inflation to the discount price as well on top of that? And that's great. <laughs> that's, you know, to me, if they're going to, you know, if they're not going to assume inflation on the metal price and then they're going to assume inflation on the discount rate, hey, you know, it's all better for the, the market is negotiating for you. <laughs> so. that's, that's what I love. That's what I love. And you and you said it very aptly and it's a great phrase. And it's kind of like the, the corollary of that is the debt markets, which I think is the worst possible investment. And I did an MBA. I think you similarly qualified, uh, probably a CFA and MBA or whatever. But you talking net present values, that's very accounting speak. But debt used to be the risk free premium. And you got then you had to do a business. You had to be above the hurdle rate uh, of the the rate on a ten year treasury bond. Now the thing that's missing is almost we need to remove the risk free element to debt. There's quite a high probability of default failure or some form of sleight of hand failure, which is the the, the inflation, the negative uh, the negative real returns for a very long time, assuming you don't get a big bust and a reset. Uh, and they say we can't pay or you've been converted into some other instrument in some reset sleight of hand, uh, magician's sleeve, you know, all of this stuff. And there's no risk of premium being associated with a 30 year T bill or a 10 year T bill. And you, on the other hand, are talking about you get in a risk premium reward of 10 percent and then you're getting the inflationary just to keep it real in real terms uh, discount on top of it. Uh, with with a flat gold price at the levels that are four hundred dollars plus plus below where it is now. I mean, it it seems too good to be true. Part of that, when you see too good to be true, you go, 
What is it I'm not seeing? And the big thing I raised to you is government nationalization, almost like a world gets synchronized. They all say this is key asset, silver, da, 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 because I'm putting the solar panels on everywhere I live. Uh, I want to be totally self-reliant. It costs a certain amount. This I'm not, it's not, South Africa isn't the only place that has sketchy power or people that want to exploit solar, et cetera, et cetera. This demand for silver, will they eventually uh, just, you know, could mines be nationalized, private and listed ones, or could government lock in prices and do some form of Marxism where they say it's deemed such a critical metal, it, it's not a price discovery mechanism, silver can't sell for more than $30 an ounce, gold can't sell for more, that might not happen to gold, it's less industrial, but gold can't sell for more than 2500 These things get locked and these businesses then have to work to a fixed supply contract and you just have price fixing. I mean, even in America, they had rental controls in the communism era, they've done this. And we are very, very worryingly taking quite a Marxist turn globally, especially the West, it has to be said, culturally, uh, fiscally, in terms of pet projects and bizarre, you know, news media outlet management how's that for the rate card do these maybe do all these people that are selling so cheap and i'm taking a long time to ask the question is there something uh, that we've got a plan for and what's your plan for how you do how you do that how do we get around it look first of all nationalization has been a risk has been around for ages um, and still we have sure. those numbers i said about 30 percent of the gold space including mines especially uh of global assets assume other periods that did see you know a wave of of nationalization the 1970s was a period that we did see that a lot and i think that's highly likely because that's a function of higher prices usually you tend to see nationalization increase as well now we're so far from that in my view as far as 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 you know i think the frothiness needs to be created first we are not in the frothy environment at all um uh, and I would also point out that this is sort of unique to each each project in each country. Um, there are, you know, when a country takes that approach of going there, it's sort of a desperate approach. And so we got to understand the economics of their own uh, economy as well uh, prior to making those deals um, and understanding the relationship between you and your project and and that uh, and those those uh, those policymakers that are uh, likely to make those types of changes. Another thing I would point out is everything has a price. Now, you know, if you ask me that you're going to buy a mine in Africa per se, uh, you know, and uh, and pay billions and billions of dollars for that mine or for that project itself, uh, then I would say probably yeah. You know, if you're making you know, you, you're buying something for, let's call it 10 times free cash flow. Um, and uh, and with the risk of nationalization, that's probably not priced into that asset. Now, if you're buying something that basically is being sold by, call it, you know, 50 million, and the mine is producing at these prices of gold, you know, two, $300 million every year. Um, you know, it's basically pain itself, you know, in a year or two. So your risk now is really a, a, a timing problem, right? I mean, it's, is it, you know, it, does it happen in two years? Does it never happen? There's a chance of that too, never happening. In, and But maybe if it happened in seven years from when you bought it, you already got your money back way ahead of that. So, you know, those are all things that I think need to be uh, assumed as, as you make those decisions of buying. When you buy a mine, most of the times you're making a commitment of, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of here, unless yeah. you, you're looking to resell it, which is another strategy that we're open for those things too. And so um, idea is, is buying something really, really cheap that is already overpricing that risk, uh, not pricing any, any you know, the, the terminal rate is basically, you know, six months when you buy in a mine for 40 millions uh 40 million dollars that is producing over 100 million dollars right uh you yeah. know that that's the terminal rate is basically you're saying this this mine is going to go out of production in six months or so do you believe in that i don't so well then then you know when gold when silver prices reach 150 200 an ounce which i think it could, could be possible please don't quote me on this but i think we could see gold and silver prices or copper at stupid levels because of the amount of leverage we have in the system as we see those things happening, yes, then I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to try to sell those assets. First of all, if I don't, I'm going to try to uh, uh, harvest that free cash flow the best way I can, uh, because I do think the risk of nationalization is going to be drastically increased. Now, in the world where silver is still trading with a two handle, still is the case. Um, you know, I, I just can't imagine that that would be uh, uh, the case today. I, I think we're we're far from that, and the market is way overpricing these things. Um, and, and and maybe and our risk as investors is to diversify. You know, why put all your eggs on the one area? You know, put your eggs in the U.S., put your eggs in in South America, put your eggs in uh, Europe, put your eggs in Africa, put your eggs in Japan. You know, maybe a few places will get nationalized. Who knows? But not all of them. And if you get one winner, you're done. You know, <laughs> that's really the play here. So. To me, that's you know that's sort of the opportunity. I think in six months from um, six five years from now, we're not going to see these opportunities. I think they're going to be priced much higher. I think the the the, the risk is going to be mispriced, and, uh, and 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 the fundamentals and and the risk reward is going to be very different. Now in today's environment, it's it's you know it's a given. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And for those listening, by the way, Tavi is talking about some of the money down that not the full price necessarily is always paid. So those 50 million numbers with two, 200 returns, um, because there's also a case of there's got ready uh, clients that are prepared to front end um, seek accreditation, isn't there, in terms of deal structuring as well, that say, hey, give us just just let us be your exclusive buyer at any price, whatever the market price is. Um, and so you actually can get funding um, in instances from businesses that are actually short the metals, even though the mines seem to be unloved. They've got ready buyers. And that's what people don't understand is that the market is short of metals. That's the truth. And the people that buy metals from mines, they need that ASAP. And they want to secure their logistics and, and, uh, and inventory as well as possible. And so they are... You know, that's the willingness of going above and beyond in order to secure inventory, which is a, an environment we just haven't seen. Like the early 2000s wasn't this way. I mean, not at all. I mean, the, the, the depression of capital spending that we're seeing in this industry is something unique that maybe goes back to the 1970s. None of us have enough data to really know, but... From what I've calculated and seen so far, it's the most similar environment for the mining industry, not for the macro, for the mining industry that I know of. And that's because we, during that period, also didn't see a lot of discoveries. That was a period where it was like a 10 years where discoveries didn't really happen. There was a, also skepticism in investing in mining. And then after gold prices had that run up that we had during the 1970s, uh, it basically unleashed the 1980s and 1990s or so, one of the biggest periods of exploration that we've seen in the history of the mining industry. Now, some of the biggest mines were actually discovered during that period. Now, I think we're going to get there. We're going to see a discovery age as well. But first, <laughs> first, we're going through this battle of mining companies that are seeing their reserves fall off a cliff at the same time as the existing reserves themselves are deteriorating massively in 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 um, in quality because of the average grades are declining. About you know, call it one fourth of the mines in the world today of gold deposits are refractory. And for people that don't know, refractory is very non-economic, very difficult to mine. And so that's that's what the problem is. And so it's creating, setting the stage for people that want to create the next major companies to do that and you know that's what i'm trying to do yeah sounds positively exciting and great and what else in terms of macro let's leave the the, the mining side uh generally aside particularly that of private mines but what else in the macro do you think the majors but well before we leave mining entirely have the majors forward sold too much is that why they're not also getting a lot of benefit to the because they will be you know the derivative desk they will they will do some degree of cover do you have any view on how the, how they've forward sold uh have they got this wrong themselves in terms of forecasting and they're not getting the the current price. Uh, I think they've been. It is a function of lack of capital force those businesses to be ultra conservative, even in their estimates of of mm -hmm. their business it's themselves. And 
I think that, you know, j just do it, do an exercise and look at the estimates for a technology business versus a mining company. And you will see drastic differences on, you know, on aggressiveness of estimates. Right. And, and that's just a function of attractiveness of capital. You know, the more capital comes into an industry, it creates that froth. And that froth is is usually reflected on on estimates, and so yeah. you know I think that's just a function of capital dried up completely in this industry, and you know the people and you asked me the question about as well about what types of 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 returns we can see. Look, usually we tend to see new billionaires being created in 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 gold cycles, and you know so try to try to get in front of that, right? I mean. Uh, try to understand the history, how those billionaires became billionaires. You know, how did Pierre Lasson became Pierre Lasson? How did Tom Kaplan became Tom Kaplan? And and you know, usually uh, there's different paths you can take. Uh, Eric Sprott, how did Eric Sprott make so much money in the early 2000s all the way to the end of that the full decade of the gold cycle? You know, how did he do all that? And 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 how can we replicate those strategies today given all these imbalances that are creating these opportunities and you know that that's what fascinates me and in and and gets me excited every day because i think we are living in an environment of a wealth creation that we haven't seen in a long time potential and i i um you know i think deploying capital smartly right now is is one of the the smartest things you can do and so um so yeah i mean I'm, I'm not trying to you know i think there's going to be plenty of successful people out there I, I just don't know who you know i know some of them that are likely to be um and they're all you know try to try to be in front of that and and try to be you know creating those types of partnerships that of those guys that will be succeeding in this cycle because i think it's it's inevitable my opinion that we're going to see one of the biggest and longest mining cycles in history and the main reason for that is because the depression of capital spending is what create in low the the cycle itself and you know we could see a 10 15 year cycle in mining who knows yeah and a technical analysis as a chartist absolutely supports that the deeper the dip and the more prolonged and the more light the uranium was as rick rule was pointing out you know five seven years ago it's it's, it's hated an industry it becomes so shall it be disproportionately loved on the rebound. In other words, there's nothing that really was low to come back into fashion really big. Uh, and the harder down, the, the faster up. It's, it's got a natural geometry to it almost in, in essence. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's certainly super, super exciting. Silver versus gold and the outlook for silver versus gold. Do you have um, some uh, comments on it? And are there any other precious metals that you think are partly interesting? I sometimes discuss platinum as well, a bit unique and a bit uh, Russia, South Africa <laughs> biased, but nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, outside of gold and silver, the the uh, level of research out there in, in other metals is is difficult. It's very uncovered metals, and 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 I'm speaking more technically speaking about about the mining space and so forth. And yeah. th these are very um, uh, uncovered markets, and therefore that is sort of a word for opportunity too. And um, I I believe that uh, you know we try to be cute looking at you know, the volatility and saying, oh, copper, you know, copper has got more cyclicality than gold and silver is is the high beta version of gold. But the truth is, once gold starts moving, everything else follows in, in the metal world. And, you know, some will move more than others. And historically, what we know about history, at, at least, is that silver, especially at the ratio that it is currently, should be doing very well in a gold cycle. Uh, and so, to me, it's a it's a big bat. It's it's looking for leverage on silver. To me, is one of the most important things. Um, the interesting thing in the metal world is that, despite the fact that gold is making the big move recently, along with copper, but gold has been really leading the way. It's yeah. interesting to me that you still have, despite the fact that the metal is so high, there you know, like I said before, there's projects that mine gold that are still selling for nothing, and so. That to me is also just as good as an opportunity as buying silver itself. And so, you know, you can buy gold in the ground for, for pennies on the dollar. So that to me is also interesting. But 
I like zinc a lot. Uh, if I would answer that uh, in a different way that I think most guests of your show would, would answer, I would say Before zinc. You do that, can I stop you there? Explain yeah. what zinc is used for so that everybody, as you go into your narrative, understands. Because I even don't know or fully appreciate the value of zinc and how it's in everything we have. It's it's almost as as used as copper basically, and in in the as a base metal for construction in in a lot of things that we're gonna need for data centers, green revolution, and also the onshoring of building infrastructure for industries and all sorts of things. Uh, zinc can also be used as as a metal technology as well, which is now being under a lot of different advancements in that front too. Uh, and so zinc is, is, is one of the most industrial uh, commodities you can look for. The key thing of zinc is that if you take an outlook of the zinc over zinc prices over the last 100 years, zinc has actually been in this channel, right? And it's been in this big channel throughout 100 years of history. And it makes this massive bull cycles and then a massive bear cycle. And where we are today is that we're turning, in my opinion, we're turning at the very low end of that range, historically speaking, and you know, do a research uh, yourself and look at most of the metals relative to inflation, and you will see that most metals have not moved at all. And I'm not talking about CPI. I'm talking about use gold. You know, look at zinc prices in gold terms. Look at you know, we know we all look at silver in gold terms, but look at older other metals too. And you will find, you know, things have not moved at all. And it, that's maybe a main reason why inflation is starting to happen now versus the last 20, 30 years. Inflation wasn't as drastic as we're seeing recently because metal prices have just not outperformed gold itself or true inflation. Now, that's not true throughout history. Throughout history, we do see periods where metals outperform inflation. And so I think we're entering an, an environment like that. And so... When I think about all the, 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 the uses of silver in the world today, uh, I'm sorry, not silver, zinc, and I look at the price and I look at a mining project selling for nothing in the zinc world, you know, that I think that's, um, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's not only one of the most useful metals in the world, uh, but it will also uh, be in high demand. And I think prices... You know, if we use more realistic prices of most of these mining projects being sold for nothing in zinc prices, you will see even better opportunities than other metals. And so um, I highly doubt that just the history, you know, let's say lithium, right? Lithium is a bad uh, on, on the battery technology is, a, you know, like I said, you buy in a mine in lithium or any other metal, you're making a commitment of 10, 15 years. Who knows if in, 15, in 10 years or seven years, the best technology for batteries is still using lithium. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. anybody knows that. Um, and you know, now with lithium prices 80% lower, you know, that bad changes the risk reward. Uh, now I do know that zinc has been used in the economy for Forever. centuries and will likely be the case moving forward. I don't think that's gonna change. It's not dependent on technology uh, shifts. Um, and so, I think that that's a, that's a safe bet on the demand side that although it's cyclical, um, you know, knowing that in inflationary periods, commodities tend to do better than financial assets, I would think that zinc could be one of those leading metals on the upside. And so uh, I'm speaking my book because we have a very large exposure to sure. zinc as well. So I guess... I like when people speak their book because that's that means they have capital behind it, right? I mean, yeah, so, yeah, confidence I in their opinions and have backed them with money. Um, I never understood that argument. It's like, wow, this guy's talking his book. That's great. <laughs> He's got yeah, capital probably, behind yeah, it. Sure. <laughs> I want to see he believes it. 100%. I agree with that. Uh, so zinc, the poss possibly the next copper, because copper started to get, you know, uh, sort of hype behind it. Uh, as I mentioned when we pre-chatted, I think it was our friend... Um, uh, the, the hedgy with uh, George Soros, his name always skips me. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, Druckenberg, Druckenmiller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Druckenmiller, who is starting to say the, the, the big play call is now copper. He, he will only come out after he's got his own position on, I'm sure. Uh, and we were, we were calling on copper quite a long time ago uh, in our ETFs, the three ETFs people can buy that are all part of the inflation and the commodity bull market. And we gave a couple there. Um, so zinc could be the next one possibly of that. Um, what, what do you think 
could uh, could happen? Do are there many zinc miners? Are there people watching this? How could they participate in your opinion without being in your say your fund? Let's say they just go buy a, a zinc equity that's listed. Uh, who where would you direct them? Which is well managed, low P's. Yeah, some of the the major companies may have exposure to zinc to a certain degree, but I think majority of the best mines are still private, and uh, so private. that's the difficulty of all this uh, of of finding exposure. Now, somebody can still buy zinc prices themselves, and that's one way to play this. If you're mm -hmm. looking to do something less fancy and betting on the price itself, that's that's not a way to do it. Now. Zinc being the next copper, you know, I, 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 I don't, I think that's an upside and that's a, you know, a great upside if it ever happens, but we don't even need that, right? I mean, if we just see the demand of zinc staying, meaning the function of zinc in the economy staying where it is, or, you know, which I would argue it's going to increase because of the needs. Like, I think that most importantly for investors is thinking about this infrastructure changes we're seeing globally, because I was, I was shocked when I did the math myself. I was, I was thinking about this as like, well, what is a true demand for metals in the future because of the infrastructure developments? Like what we are likely to see because of the deglobalization trends, forcing people to, you know, reinvest capital into their own countries and trying to uh, revamp their capabilities as a country. Um, and then I looked at historically, I was like, maybe we can use history in the US. Let's just say the US for as an example here. When was the last time we've seen major infrastructure developments? Well, this was, you know, we saw one in the 40s, the Highway Act. Um, and the Highway Act, you know, despite the fact that we still, you know, most of the highways that we drive on in the US, uh, were, came from that act, came from that period of infrastructure development, is nothing relative to the numbers we're seeing today. And that is adjusting for inflation and also adjusting for GDP, because that's important. Um, and then I looked at, I was like, well, here's an a interesting data that is important. After World War II, countries went on, Marshall Plan and others, um, to rebuild the global economy. And so, you know, we can calculate how much was used at that time. And I was looking at that number globally, not just in the U.S., to rebuild the global economy. Um, and if you adjust those numbers to today's inflation and also relative to GDP of the U.S., not global GDP, you will find that today's spending is about three times what we saw back then. So... I think what we're seeing in terms of infrastructure uh, spending and changes in manufacturing spending and all that is probably something we haven't seen in over a hundred years easily. So you now when we looked at the demand for materials back in the seventies and the demand for the forties and the demand for 1910s, those three decades are the inflationary periods we had over the last hundred plus years. I think we're going to, I think we're going to dwarf those amounts. I mean, I think we're going to see something even crazier. And then I looked at the spending of, you know, that companies are doing to secure supply in the long term. And I know that they're not spending any money today. <laughs> it's like, man, that might be the biggest demand supply mismatch we're probably going to see in, in the history of commodities, or at least for the last two to 200 years or something. Um, so now I'm not trying to sound you know, overhype the story, but that's, you know, there's a famous phrase from, from Bill Gates. And I hate, I hate paraphrasing Bill Gates, but it is a smart sentence. You know, he basically said, you know, people tend to overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. And that's such an eloquent, you know, way of, of explaining what we have today. You know, yeah, people are now talking about copper, like it's, you know, it's going to, we're going to see shortages tomorrow, but you know, and, and maybe that might not happen tomorrow. We may see a, a price dip tomorrow. Who knows? Now, in five to 10 years, yeah, I think we're all underestimating what copper could do, you know, even myself. And so um, I, I, I focus on those things because I think that that's where the real capital is is there to be made is, is in those long-term stories and not short-term um, uh, metrics about markets. Although I pay attention to them, 
um, I think that that's re the real opportunities in those those types of uh, you know visions that you have for for the future. Yeah. So we we basically in the most unique macro state that I've ever think we've ever come across because we have a globalized synchronized world that all seems to be in a debt based paradigm that is very close to its mathematical terminal velocity in an environment which sees clearly debt and fiat currencies chronically deflating purchasing power, which is the hyper stagflation essentially, in an environment where we probably need to regrid the world for a new world system, which is gonna be very technologically driven, I suspect, not to our, our great freedoms, uh, I also suspect, but nonetheless, it's coming in some way or another. Uh, and we have the most, uh, punished industry go into absolute hated mode brought to you by BlackRock, uh, Larry Finkelstein and the ESG agenda. And uh, could we be looking at, you know, gold, silver, zinc, as you've mentioned so eloquently here, they're going to mining full stop. It's going to become like uh, the great loathe uranium uh, post Fukushima. Uh, are we at that moment only larger probably that's how it feels and uh, i don't want to also over egg and over hype the bull but sometimes things just look they just look right don't they from uh, from planets lining up yeah and by the way the thesis is despite the fact that it's been progressing and developing in the last three years or so i've been more i guess um openly talking about these things in the last three years and deploying capital into this as well. And by the way, you know, the thesis has not been unleashed. And so, you know, maybe there's another three years I had, a, you know, of, of more of a consolidation and, and depression in the mining industry. I have, I don't have the, the, um, the crystal ball for that, but I admire investors that are able to, uh, in history, um, deploy capital in a bold way uh, into a long-term thesis that they were foreseen. And I think it's much easier to plan for things in, 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 you know, five, 10 years I had, especially 10 years, 15 years I had, and, and being able to sustain that conviction with, despite the fact that the asset value of your investment hasn't changed and being able to build even more of those assets and and accumulate more of those those cheap opportunities for you know especially in the view of the that capital allocator uh is is where i i really take my hat off i think people that really made a lot of money are able to um to act that way uh for years and and then and then as they establish almost an empire in this industry uh, or any other industry uh they then take advantage of the favorable uh, macro changes that they were foreseen at first uh, that then happens later on. And so to me, that's really like, you know, the monthly changes. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I, and I'm sure you do too, get messages about what's going on with gold and all today and all that. And I'm like, man, does that really matter? Um, you know, I can have an answer. I, I, I probably would come up with an answer for these things, but uh where you should be spending most of your focus and capital and attention is is you know is in that big picture and that's uh, I think it's a um, it's an ability that is very difficult to um, to uh, to replicate you know there's a reason there's a few billionaires and uh, and I, hey by the way I'm not here to say I will be one I'm I, I'm here to I'm here to try to replicate those guys and learn from them and try to you know. And, and force myself into this industry the smartest way I can, but in, I could fail too, and that's that's uh, you know that's that's part of the game. But I, I'm not I'm I'm not here to uh, you know I'm I'm here with uh, with a lot of conviction and trying to act on something like you said. It seems maybe obvious uh, for some, and but for majority of folks, it, it, as it hasn't been obvious at all. Like how do we see people or central banks shifting from treasuries to gold and we don't see 60 40 portfolios completely shifting their allocation and becoming much more diversified and maybe going from zero percent allocation in gold to maybe five maybe 10 maybe 15. um 
I think that's highly likely. And and all these shifts of migration of capital into hard assets, you know, we don't need much of that migration to revalue assets in a big way. And that's you know that's called asymmetry. And so I like those things. Yeah, it sounds absolutely right. You, the, the point you hit on there on the 60-40 is bonds just aren't doing what they're supposed to do and they're unlikely to replicate that balancing performance that they once played. The 40-year escalator has now probably become a five or six-year elevator uh, and people are going to start realizing that and one of the things they're going to grab for whilst the whole metaverse is still being inflated uh, is going to be the physical things. It's got to be. Uh, and that allocation isn't there yet. It's not in individuals' portfolios. Banks aren't putting in it. It's because they don't make money off selling it. And and that's the bias about it. It doesn't come with a sales commission and, a, and, a, and you know, the first 20% off the top creamed by some intermediating broker because it's almost too true a price. You get your gold ounce, you pay for it. There's very small margins. It's it's not a it's it's not a milk it's, uh, a product, is it? Um, Tabby, this has been absolutely awesome. You made an amazing case for um, mining. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Any parting thoughts uh, you'd like to give our audience on how to do? I couldn't help think there was one word that was really I was waiting to come out of your lips that didn't have a chance, but will probably be in there somewhere. Patience, isn't it? Because it may not be next year. When you're playing the long game, it may not actually be next year. It could get slowed down. There could be a demand-destroying event globally. There could be a, another thing. There could be time for a little bit of a world war. Who knows? But when you position with the macro and you really checked all your facts properly, the, the, the eventuality is always there, and sometimes it's just the holding on. And that's where many people give up. They, they are tomorrow, next week, or when do I become rich out of this? Uh, and I think maybe if you a passing comment on patience as well as your final thoughts. Yeah, and I, I would say that uh, patience is absolutely critical. And one important thing is, is a lot of people tend to focus on, you know, a breakout of a price of a matter or something along those lines. But let's just say you've got that technical confirmation that for you gives you confidence to now deploy money into this. If you're just now trying to learn about this industry because of a technical breakout, you're lost because you're, you know, you're not going to have time to do it. I mean, I've been, I've been studying this industry for years, right? I mean, if anybody who has been here, for a while, that person is probably going to have an edge on other folks. And this ability of understanding that market is going to become in high demand, in my view. And there's going to be other opportunities. I don't think mining is the only one. Let's just say emerging markets, um, you know, people that understand the Brazilian market very well, or, or South Asia, perhaps, would be another one to look at. Um, yeah. and, uh, or, or South America overall, you know, those folks that have a very good understanding of those markets are probably going to be in high demand as well. And so, um, you know, that's the way I think about this, because despite the fact that I look at technicals, I look at prices and all sorts of things. Um, I, I think that the preparation comes before that price confirmation. And if you're not prepared enough when the timing is right and we will know when the timing is right now things are going to start moving in the right direction capital is going to start flowing in instead of two messages now you're going to start getting you know 200 messages from folks asking you questions about different things and that's how things start to change in an exponential way and and you start getting deals and and you know that's you know that's the world i want to be in five years not that i'm not now but i want to be even more in five years right so that's the mindset and, and and that I think most investors should be taking. And uh, unfortunately, I won't I won't be able to make a lot of investors be that way. And that's that's really the opportunity is, is that a lot of people won't do that. And so, you know, I I, <laughs> I, I am fairly young. I love my generation because they're so lazy. <laughs> it's <laughs> the best generation I could ask for to compete. And so. They're so lazy that I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't have a lot of competition right now. So that's, uh, I feel like competing with a few people. And so it's, it's great. They're all asleep. <laughs> They're all asleep and the greatest opportunity is passing by. Excellent, Tavi. I really <laughs> Indeed. I've really enjoyed this. Hang on. I want to uh, give you some details after, but uh, 
where do people that you would want to engage with you? How do they find uh, and, and uh, follow you? Or uh, in, what what would you like to give as your plug for people that have enjoyed our chat? Uh, Twitter or LinkedIn are my social media places that I'm more, um, I guess, uh, 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 I guess, active. Uh, Tavi Costa at Tavi Costa is on Twitter, or you can also find just Tavi Tavi Costa on LinkedIn. You'll find me, and you can message me or, or engage there if you wanted to. And also, uh, I write letters as well, research letters, macro research letters for Cresket. If you go to Cresket.net, uh, we have you know the funds that we manage, but also all these types of research uh, pieces that we write that are you know tend to be. You know, with the idea of, of writing about what we think it's going to happen uh, and, and, and that vision that I was referring to and, and how do we uh, how do we put things together is, is sort of a good way to uh, if, if you're more interested in learning more, I think that that would be a good way to to start. Amazing. Awesome. Really enjoyed the chat. Uh, goodbye uh, and thank you. And I look forward to when we get you back on again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.